I am David, as, as Erica mentioned, I'm streaming live from Canmore, Alberta. That is a, a Rocky Mountain small town in, in Alberta, Canada. I work at Snap Travel. Snap Travel is based in Toronto. It's a travel technology company that's grown to about 50 people there, though these days we're more technology than travel. And really, really excited today to talk to, to everyone here about the super passionate topic of how to structure a data team. Uh, and I'm surprised that there's there's so many people interested in, in this topic. It's something that's very near and dear to my heart and hopefully something that I can uh, shed some light on for, for the audience today. So without further ado, what, what are we talking about? And what, what the, the topic of this, this talk is all about is, is really that data team structures should exist to maximize efficiency. And what that means is data team structures are very, very expensive, both from a salary and from a vendor BI tool standpoint. And we can talk all about being data informed or data driven. But at the end of the day, unless you're a, a Google or Facebook, the data at your company is not the product that the, the customer or the client is buying. And I think a lot of data people need to take that as a grain of salt because it's very, very hard for, for data teams to, to show that attributable value because at the end of the day, we are influencing business decisions, but we are not the end product itself. So because of that, I think it's super, super important to make sure that what resources companies do pour into these data teams is used sparingly and, and optimized to the nth degree. So what are some of the things that we're, we're hoping to learn today? The first is the most obvious is the trade-offs of a centralized versus an embedded team. And I'll define that for, for everyone here. The second is that data problems really are full stack problems. I was chatting with Emily from Net, Netlify a couple of weeks ago, and it's something that she said, so I can't take credit for, but it's something that really stuck with me where data problems for the end user are not just an analyst's problems. Data problems far up in the data pipeline are not just an engineering problem. Any data problem really is a full stack problem. And a spoiler alert, my belief is that you need a full stack team to address those full stack problems. And then the third thing that we're talking about, the first is, is defining exactly what is a domain-based team structure, but the second part of it is figuring out what are the limitations of that, of that team structure. And a bit about the journey of Snap Travel. Snap Travel subscribed to um, an article that Tristan actually had put out, I wanna say three years ago, hopefully someone can link it in the chat, all about the, the startup founders guide and, and how they should be using analytics. And it's something that we used for a while, but it, it didn't really address the team structure problem. So about a year ago, when we were start, starting to scale our team a little bit more, Nahil and I, who's, who's also in the chat, were discussing you know, how should we optimize this team structure so that we can do a good job for, for our team. And we talked to a bunch of other teams and, and no one really had any answers. So we actually tried out about five different team structures, which if anyone on my team is here, we apologize. That's a lot of org structures. We would not recommend that. That's a lot of change. And there's a lot of reasons that organizations, organizations should not do that. But we tried five different ones and we eventually landed on one called the domain-based team structure that we really, really like. And I'm basically here today to tell you what that is and how it works. So what do I mean by data team structures and, and how they should maximize efficiency. Any organization will have what I call, what we call data resources. And there's a bunch of different roles assigned to them that are at the top of the slide, but those people uh, work day to day with data. And the other kind of types of people that are, that are at an organization are the stakeholders. So the people that those data resources are looking to serve. Generally, those are the people making the business decisions or serving the clients or talking to suppliers. And when I talk about data team structures existing to maximize efficiency, I mean, how do we organize our data resources so that they can help those stakeholders in the best way possible? And also help each other in the best way possible. And when we were exploring this, what we found out was that really the problem is, is kind of threefold. The, the first is it's a platform problem. So what are the tools we're using to help the data team work together? Uh, and I know this is a crazy conference to talk about this app, but we actually use DBT to help all of our data roles interact and, and 
speak the same language. Then the, the, the next two parts of the problem uh, is really what I want to address today, which is that it's a, a people and a process problem as well. The people is, is how do we organize the team and the process is what are the rules of engagement between the team and the business stakeholders. So first we'll talk about this centralized versus embedded. And a, a lot has been written about this. You can quickly Google it and you'll probably get more information than this slide, but at a high level, a centralized model is the center of excellence model where the data resources all work on the same team and they exist to serve the business stakeholders kind of like a client and a consultant would. The embedded model is where analysts work embedded on the business units teams and report up to senior members or heads of the business lines like finance, growth, or supply. So when we were thinking about centralized versus embedded, we thought, okay, what are the trade-offs of each model? And th the first one is really prioritization. So when you are a small data team growing like we were, it's super, super important to be company aligned. And one of the reasons or one of the things that alerted us to this slight issue was when we were in an embedded model and we were busy building out all of the KPIs for all the different teams. And one of our analysts worked on the customer support team and he did a great job building out the customer support data knowledge, data framework, and established all the KPIs, built all the dashboards, did all the data modeling. And when he was done with that, the, the team needed a lot of help with customer support tickets. So we started working on customer support tickets. Now that was great for the team because he was working on the highest priority team projects. The issue with it was that there were a ton of other teams that needed data help that weren't getting it. And this was really the, the straw that broke the camel's back when it came to deciding to move to a centralized model was that we could now prioritize things at a company level. The second is the idea of knowledge share. So if you're a, a small growing team like we were, who's, who's building out DBT, there's a lot of communication that needs to happen when you're building out those first couple data models and you're establishing best practices that will carry you from the five, 10 models you initially build to the hundred or 500 models that you eventually will build. And the data and technical knowledge share of syntax, naming conventions, things like that is super, super important for data analysts to constantly be talking about. And in a centralized model that worked well, in an embedded model, it didn't work as well. And then the last one is mentorship. When an analyst is on a centralized model and, and we're all reporting to the same analytics lead, they are learning a lot about data analysis, best practices, or different coding tricks that they might learn from the engineers. When they're on the embedded model, they're learning a lot about the industry and how to talk to customers and how to talk to suppliers and how to sell people on different things and how to use data to sell those people. And this is perhaps a bit of a hot take, but from my experience in, in data analytics, a lot of data analysts would rather learn more about data analysis than they would about whatever industry they're in. And for us, that was a helpful way to frame the conversation around centralizing our, our data team. So these were kind of the trade-offs we considered, but this wasn't the only change we made. And again, to solve that people issue, we went through a ton of different iterations that I'll kind of go over now. So the first one was this framework that we, that we have on the slide here. We basically took all of our data resources on the left and we said, okay, what are all the teams that need data help? And in actuality, there's about seven or eight of those teams. And we said, okay, as it exists now in the embedded model, all the data engineers work together, which is awesome. They can share ownership over everything. They can pitch in when things break. They can go help different, optimize different DAGs, whatever it may be. The analysts being embedded was great for building business context, not so great for scaling DBT. So if you are a, I'll say this again, if you are a young organization with not a lot of data resources in your organization in an embedded model, it is very, very difficult to scale DBT and share all that knowledge if you stay in that embedded model. I'm not saying it can't be done. I don't know the ins and outs of, of every organization. We tried it at Snap Travel. It definitely did not work. 
So we were small, we, we switched around and we decided to centralize. And we brought all the data analysts on the same team reporting up to an analytics lead. And this made it super helpful to keep consistency in what is revenue, what is churn, what is, you know, all these different metrics that, that's been talked about at length today. And that was really, really good for a little bit. But again, it goes back to that problem that data problems are in fact full stack problems. And our first iteration of, of centralizing the analysts did not address that issue where if we had an issue with the Google API, for instance, we do a lot of marketing on Google and that was being shown down at the business level, the, the data analysts could only track that so far and then they'd have to create a ticket and throw it in the data engineering side of the organization for them to look at. And that might take a couple hours and it might, there might be some conversation around prioritization about whether that ticket is, is addressing maybe the priorities of the data engineering organization. And that takes time. So we said, you know what, we don't want all these blockers. Everyone remember that that org structure change we made two months ago to centralize the analysts. Yeah, now we're, we're changing it again. And we're just going to throw everyone on the same team. And this full stack team was really, really great. And, and honestly, I wish we had skipped the middle step. I wish we had gone straight to throwing everyone on the same team. It was great because everyone was in the same meetings. We had morning meetings where we could discuss the API issue and in the span of five minutes, figure out exactly what was the issue and that someone would go prioritize that problem. Why it didn't work is because despite COVID and everything happening, we were still growing as an organization. And, and all of a sudden we had 10 people on our data team sitting in on meetings about API issues with Google. And that was good for context sharing, but the cost of coordination and making sure that everyone was in meetings that were relevant and only working on things that could be relevant to them was not good for with such a big team. So that people problem had now been solved because now all of a sudden everyone was on the same team, but then it, it quickly morphed into a process problem. So what, what, processes, what is this, this domain structure? And that's, that's a question I've gotten a lot since, since the, the blog post that, that we wrote went out. And I'm hoping today we can kind of, kind of clear things up. So the domain based structure is really a process that we follow using a full stack data team. And really there's three key roles. There's domain stakeholders. Those are the people that you're doing the work for. There's domain leads. Those are senior people on the data team, the full stack data team, who have ownership over different outcomes, whether that's building dashboards, whether that's doing analyses, whether that's pushing code to our, our product repo. And they're the ones who own all the different things that need to be done for the domain stakeholder. And then you have domain contributors. And those domain contributors are people on the data team who have excess time available to pitch in on other domains. And Perhaps it's it's best illustrated with an example. We have a very senior member of our team is the domain lead for finance and has been for for six months now. And it's it's his job to own all the different needs that fi the finance team may have when it comes to data. So that includes integration with our new ERP system. That includes putting data together for investor requests. That includes making sure the dashboards are fixed when someone doesn't understand a revenue column, whatever it might be. And he is a liaison with the senior finance manager and head of finance who go to him when they have issues. And every two weeks, he um, works with the domain stakeholder and all the domain contributors to prioritize all the different things that need to be done over the next two weeks. And they have a discussion. They decide that about five days of time is required for everyone to complete all the tasks associated with finances needs. And if it's 10 days or if it's 15 days, he will go talk to more domain contributors and try to get help on those projects. Those domain contributors then agree, yes, okay, you know, I, I have time for this, or this is a priority, or, or no, I can't do that project because this other growth project needs my help. And they agree to the work for the next two weeks. 
we follow an agile, so so it's it's super easy for us to to do it this way. And then on a on a daily cadence during standup, every domain contributor and every domain lead will talk about the things that are that are happening in that domain. And again, because we're full stack, there's engineers and there's analysts who are both working on finance projects who are in a meeting talking about the problems that are facing that finance team. And every now and then the domain stakeholder will also show up to that meeting and chime in on things that need to be done. Now, the, the image on the screen is super, super confusing. And I get that. But part of that is also good because there's a lot of confusion I shouldn't say confusion, I should say organized chaos around who's a domain lead and who's a domain contributor on any given domain. And the reason for that is that we like that people are on different domains and, and domain leaders of one domain will have help from a domain leader of another domain as a domain contributor because everyone gets a, a lot of exposure to everything that's happening in the organization or at least they get second order exposure where they're working with someone who's working on something that they should know about. And the reason that's so good is because while we've since grown from, from two people two years ago to 10 people today, there's, there's still a lot of shared knowledge that needs to exist in the organization. And there's a lot of, for instance, DBT macros that are being used in product that could probably be used in ops that are shared because there's that second order relationship between domain contributors. And that's really, that's shown to be very, very helpful for, for sharing information and sharing data knowledge across the organization. So one of the reasons that the, the domain leaders really, really like the structure is because they have ownership over all the outcomes over, uh, over a given area of the business. And they, can help pitch in on other ones as a domain contributor. So they get that, that different types of work and they're not pigeonholed into, into one area. The reason that the business stakeholders really, really like this structure is because they have one person that they talk to and they know that that person is a specialist in the area that they need to be in and can prioritize for them and be their almost data champion for that different area of the business. So this has been a super, super successful structure for us. It's something we like, and hopefully your team can also take advantage of. I know it's confusing. Maybe the easiest way to explain it is to show, show a schedule of, of all the different meetings that occur and what happens in those meetings. And that would, that would make it very, very obvious. But it, it, it's something that is intentionally chaotic, but works really, really well. From a scaling perspective, one of the, the things that I've heard from people is that it won't scale. And to be honest, I don't know. I, I've never worked at a large data organization. What we know is that this works for 10 people and we think it could probably work for 20 people. Beyond that, we don't know. It's definitely a more flat hierarchy. There's a lot of division of ownership for the domain leads, which our, our team really, really likes. And we don't know if it would scale beyond, you know, 20, 25 people. So what have we, what have we kind of talked about? And this is the last slide of, of day one coalesce. We talked about how data structures or data teams rather are super, super expensive. And because of that, and because they don't actually make money in a lot of organizations, it's super important to optimize them. And at Snap Travel, we, saw that as a problem and we said, okay, this solution is kind of three pronged, it's platform people and it's process. The platform we've talked about at length today, using DBT as a tool to help analysts operate as software engineers and help them have full visibility into the transformation layer. The, the people part is getting everyone on the same team, everyone that's working on data problems on the same team. And then the process part is helping that team focus on the things that matter making sure that, that people are not pigeonholed in different parts of the organization, splitting people up and, and making 10% you know, of their job be one domain if, that, if that's required. And we found that to be a super, super helpful way to address data problems and, and something that we're, we're looking forward to continuing to scale as the data team central kind of continues to, to grow. And that is everything.